Um, so let me uh, tell you a little bit about Rita and her and give you a brief bio. She is one of our most celebrated graduates of the University of Iowa and has a longstanding relationship with international programs here at the UI. So Rita is a strong believer that international experiences are critical in higher education. She studied abroad in London and participated in the IES Dublin Summer Internship Program. Her internship experience as a radio host in Dublin led her toward the field of international education. She worked for the University of Iowa Study Abroad Office and the Tippie College of Business as a program ambassador, diversity ambassador, peer mentor, and outreach assistant. Upon graduating from the university in 2018, she taught English in Portugal through the Fulbright program. Upon returning to the US in 2019, Rita joined the Internships Division of IES Abroad to encourage students to pursue unique international programs that benefit their personal and professional lives. And so, uh, Rita, um, could you just start with kind of the basics? So uh, where are you from and how did you end up at the University of Iowa? Yeah, of course. So I'm originally from Decorah, Iowa which is in the northeastern part of the state. Um, and in terms of how I got to Iowa, so I have to be very honest with you, Iowa was, out of the nine schools that I applied to, the ninth choice. <laughs> and it wasn't until I did a campus visit and um, was admitted to um, the direct admit program of the Tippy College of Business that I realized, wow, these people are really, really friendly and really, um, they seem to look out for students and answer any kind of questions that they have. Um, so it was predominantly that and then realizing that Iowa had all of the programs that I could possibly want to study um, in case I wanted to change my major and that they had a study abroad office because that was really important to me. Um, so that's essentially how I ended up at Iowa being in state. That was also um, a really important and great decision. Overall, no regrets whatsoever choosing Iowa in the end, obviously for many, many reasons. And I also have to thank my parents for pushing me to also go to Iowa as well. So that's how I got to the University of Iowa. Well, that, that's terrific. And, and no doubt, you know, you have all sorts of wonderful experiences uh, to share, but um, do you have a favorite memory or Iowa story? Yes. So out of many, one that I thought about a lot recently um, is one that I think really shows how much the University of Iowa faculty and staff really care about the students and support their ideas, especially when students um, see that there's a potential issue on campus. So I am a proud daughter of um, immigrants from the Dominican Republic. I'm very proud Dominican American and I identify as Afro-Latina. Now the University of Iowa, unfortunately there's not a lot of representation of Afro-Latinx identities. Um, and especially when I was a student at the time, there was a lot of what I felt misunderstanding, even within the Latinx community, of what it means to be Latinx and how diverse that identity is. So I decided to create a panel to showcase how diverse that identity can be and invited a lot of different uh, professors, students, and staff to share their experiences about what it means to be Latinx and Latinx at the University of Iowa. Now, I will say that this panel would not have been possible with the support of other students, other student organization, and especially departments and programs at the University of Iowa. So I have to shout out to um, the Tepe College of Business, especially Gabriela Rivera, who helped sponsor some of um, our catering for the event. Um, Christine Jer from the uh, University of Iowa Study Abroad Office for helping with outreach. And then uh, the Portuguese department, Professora Maria Jose Barbosa and Chris Lira were fantastic at helping me outreach um, and engage students with this event. So to me, all of their support and all the care that they put into helping me, a student that just had one idea at the time, I was like, I wonder if this is possible. They helped it come to fruition. So that was probably one of my favorite moments all time. And I have to say, because of that panel, um, Zahara Aladu Rasul, who was one of my tippy mentees, has continued to do more outreach and engagement programs with Afro-Latinidad. So 
Yeah, just have to give, you know, credit where it's due that, you know, the staff at Iowa, to me, are some of the best people I've ever met. Well, that's a really encouraging story, and it underscores kind of the level of collaboration between colleges, departments, um, shared service units or central service units on campus uh, to guarantee student success. Um, So I think one of the messages that we want to convey is that if students have ideas, Um, that they shouldn't hesitate to contact faculty, their mentors, uh, because the resources do exist to promote ideas. That's one of the things that I think that attracted me to Iowa is that there's always a place for creativity and innovation, and people shouldn't hesitate to, uh, to move forward, you know, with ideas they think, you know, have, have potential. So that's great. And I'm glad that you, I'm delighted that you had that level of support. And that kind of leads us to your international experiences. Um, so can you tell us, and you alluded to this a little bit before, but can you tell us how you became interested in pursuing international experiences at the University of Iowa? Yeah. So I knew before I went to college that I needed to go abroad. I had no idea where specifically, I just knew that it needed to happen. And especially my mom was very adamant that that was going to happen in one way or another. Um, So the first experience, which was the Tippy London Winter Program was great for me because it not only counted for one of my major requirements, um, but was a great way to get a snapshot of what it would potentially be like to live Uh, in London, which at the time I felt like I was very enamored with. I had never gone to the UK, so I wanted to get a taste of what that was like. Um, So that was the first experience um, that I had. Then I, the summer after I did that program, I realized that um, I wanted to go abroad for a little bit longer, so what could I do? So in between sessions of classes, so the summer, I decided to do the IS Dublin Summer Internship Program, not only because I'd heard many, many, many great things about Dublin, but because I also needed an internship experience. By that point, I was like, I need to add things to my resume. What can I do? Here's this lovely program. So that was kind of moving on to that. And then after that summer, it just kind of kept growing where I was like, how can I keep going abroad for longer and longer? So that eventually led to um, Fulbright in Portugal. So that's right. kind of so it's, it's true that once you're bitten by the bug, it's with you forever. Yes. You know, exactly. once you feel that kind of allure of going abroad, experiencing different cultures, um, kind of challenging yourself to adapt and adjust and kind of grow as an individual, um, it's something you want to keep doing for the rest of your life. So I'm delighted that you had that that experience. And I'm, I'm wondering, are there a couple of highlights from your experiences, either in London or Dublin or elsewhere, that that stand out? Yes. Again, it and I feel like um, for those that have had international experience or have been outside of the country can relate. It can be difficult to pull favorite memories, but a couple. From London, one of the highlights was that I met lifelong friends um, from the Tippy College of Business that I don't think I would have met if I hadn't done that program. And especially when I moved to Chicago, they were there for me. They were great support systems and great friends that of course I've maintained and all thanks to this London program. In Dublin, um, aside from making a lot of really great friends, I loved, oh, loved, loved, loved Dublin so, so, so much um, because it was that perfect mix of the city life. So you got to get the hustle and bustle from Grafton Street. Um, mm-hmm. Or if you wanted to have like a quiet getaway, you could easily go to the seaside coast to Dunleary or Hoth and take a really nice walk. Um, Ireland itself has so much rich history and to me, and what I was doing with my internship as a radio host for their news department, I got to learn a lot about what current events and societal issues were really important to the Irish people that in a lot of ways were different um, to a lot of what was going on in the US or from an American standpoint, I was very fascinated at what they considered to be major issues for them. So those were a couple of highlights then. And then of course in Portugal, 
again, I'm a very social person. So friends for me were very important. I loved the um, US department, uh, the US embassy that was in Portugal. Um, very, very lovely people, made a lot of friends with them as well. And then of course the Fulbright Portugal Commission, again, super supportive whenever I had any issues come up. And then of course, my lovely, lovely friends, um, which were a mix of Portuguese and Brazilians who were in um, Porto, which to me, yes, I'm biased, but I think it is the best city <laughs> in Portugal. So <laughs> yeah. Well, no, that's that that's absolutely terrific. I mean, because those those friendships do last a lifetime. It's a very unique bonding experience, you know, and it's it's wonderful because, you know, when you're at university or at college, you're going to bond with your friends, um, you know, here in Iowa City, and those friendships will last, you know, the, the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. But when you go abroad, it's like you have a second life in that regard, or you have a second experience in that regard. So you have basically two sets of friends. Mm -hmm. um, it's really two different cohorts um, that you continue to bond with um, uh, after you leave the university, and that can enrich your your Iowa experience and just your life in general in untold old ways. So that's, that's wonderful. And, you know, you alluded a little bit to your Fulbright experience, but can you tell us why you decided to apply to that program and just what the process was like? I mean, Fulbright's very popular with our student body here. We've got a lot of success. Um, I think everybody knows that Karen Walksmith is just, you know, uh, a terrific individual and that she has uh, guided and mentored many successful applications over the last five or six years. Um, but can you tell us kind of what your individual process was like and why you wanted to be a Fulbright Scholar? Yeah, so I know I mentioned it a little bit earlier, but I was was trying to find ways in which I could be abroad longer. And one of the ways that my mom had actually brought up was the Fulbright program. Now, my mom had done the Fulbright program, mm. uh, but she had done... Uh, um, kind of the reverse side of the exchange. So she was a Fulbright awardee from the Dominican Republic to the U.S. Mm. Now, for those that are watching and interested in the process, it is different for um, U.S. students uh, to, you know, go abroad. So I had to kind of uh, look into how that could happen from that end. And that is when I attended uh, so the January before my senior year, I attended one of Karen's um, informational conference workshops. So it was like a full day of brainstorming ideas, answering questions, having alumni from Fulbright um, answer a lot of our questions about uh, what their experience was like in the whole application process. So essentially all of this started about a year before I was even notified that I got the award. So for those watching and are interested in applying, it does take time. So planning is the best thing to do. So I'm kind of gonna break it down in the timeline. January, attend the information sessions. Then throughout the spring, start finalizing um, uh, recommenders for the award, uh, finalizing some statements. Then in the summer, by the summer, I had a deadline to submit everything. So I got that in. September of my senior year comes. So mind you, we're still, now we're to senior year now. Um, I do mock interviews with the commission, uh, I submit my entire application. And then it's not until um, January that I hear that I'm a semifinalist, which is really exciting. <laughs> but to me, especially as a senior, I was like, okay, this is great. But I'm a senior and I don't know what I'm doing after graduation, you know, that kind of senior fear, like, I'm not going to have a job. I don't know what I'm doing after graduation and a lot of that panic. So at the time that I was applying for Fulbright, I was applying to other jobs, but they just didn't have that pull that Fulbright did. They didn't have the international experience that I was looking for or any kind of global touch. So to me, I was like, I really hope this Fulbright thing works out. So um, long story short, in March or early April, I believe, that's when I got noticed that I became a finalist for uh, Fulbright. And um, it was one of the happiest, most exciting days of my life. So um, that was kind of the whole process. So all in all, again, it took about a year to do that. And then I didn't set, um, set flight, not set sail, but set flight <laughs> for Portugal until um, September of 2018. So the um, fall after 
I was awarded. So that's kind of a timeline, especially for those that are interested in the process. But yeah, it's rigorous, but I highly recommend to do it because it gives um, a lot of practice in grant writing, especially, which is very transferable. So. Right. And, and what you say is so important because it's essential to make a plan, you know, and to really say to yourself, okay, this is going to take up a decent amount of time. Um, I'm going to have to go through different drafts. I'm going to have to meet with Karen. I'm going to have to meet with other folks to revise my, my proposal. I might not get accepted in one particular year, but I can reapply because, you know, once you've graduated, alums can apply yes, they can. To, to, to Fulbright. And that's kind of overlooked, uh, but, you know, that's part of our success as well because alums bring a certain amount of experience um, that, you know, that, that they acquire once they leave the university and that can be brought to bear in a Fulbright application. Yes. Um, so, you know, it's it's one of those situations where um, you have to look at it as, as you said, as a grant application, as a job application, but really, um, you know, in terms of kind of a, a longer range career goal. Mm -hmm. And one other thing that, that I would say, and I know I'm sure you did this in your application, is that if you can underscore in your application how the Fulbright experience will enrich your career possibilities, you know, and how this fits into your future plans long-term, you'll have a better chance of succeeding. Yes, exactly. That is for, again, those that are interested in applying, that is one of the questions that they ask exactly, your post Fulbright plans. So, yep. Very good. So again, I know you had a wealth of experiences when you were in Portugal, but uh, are there, is there one experience that, that, that really stands out? You know, when you wake up in the morning and you say, okay, I, I'm, I'm just thinking about all these fond memories from my time in Portugal. Um, what would be the fondest memory that, that you have? Ooh, fondest one would be, okay, one of my classes um, in which my dad had actually visited from Decora, Iowa, because I think he's a professor at Luther College, okay. and they were on their J term break, and he came to visit me in Porto, and he came to my classes. And my students, first of all, they loved him, but they loved hearing what his experience was like being an immigrant in the U.S. and being a professor in higher education in the U.S. So they got to lot uh, to ask him a lot of questions that. Obviously, with his 30 plus years of teaching and being in the U.S., he has a lot of experience that um, I was only 22, 23 at the time. So, you know, there's some seasoned experience, but we both had very different perspectives and lived experiences in the U.S. So for them, that was a really great moment. Um, that, to me, was probably one of the highlights because it showcased um, you know, what it can mean to be an American, um, because both of my parents have dual citizenship now. So for my students, that was so intriguing to them. And even when I was their professor of English, um, I remember they asked me a lot of questions, but a lot of what they had known was from, let's say, popular culture and movies, which we all tend to know is maybe not the best representation all the time or that the US in itself is so greatly diverse. So that was probably one of the highlights. And then um, another memory was actually still with my dad, but um, so in Portugal, there's a typical style of music called fado and um, they require very custom instruments. And I actually got one of my dad these custom instruments. And when we went to the shop, the shop owner, who is one of the um, traditional musicians, played with my dad in the shop. And that, to me, was probably one of the greatest moments because I got to, we both got to indulge in um, a very important part of Portuguese culture um, while being able to bring it home with us. So. Right. Oh, that, that, that's a wonderful. Sorry, Russ. Too oh, sure. No, no, that's no, that, that's great. I mean, yeah. more than one example is, is is perfect. But yeah, that's a that's a terrific bonding experience, uh, because you know it happened in country, but also your father was was there. That's a memory that you can share with him and your entire family for for the rest of your life. I mean, that's that, that's terrific. Can I ask you just one one small follow up? Mm -hmm. what, what what's the instrument again? So it's called a Portuguese guitar. Mm -hmm. um, it looks kind of like, oh, it's circular. 
So it's not like a regular looking guitar. It's very, very beautiful. Um, if anyone were to Google or look up Portuguese guitar and they see the one that's rounded, um, that is what I got my dad and what um, the shop owner was playing with him while my dad was playing classical guitar. So yeah, Portuguese guitar. I'm gonna, let's see if I can, let's see. For everyone to look up Portuguese guitar. There we go. So, yep, Portuguese guitar, the circular one. Very cool. Very cool. All right. Well, we, we will definitely consult Google and uh, and and maybe listen to some YouTube yeah, uh, videos. Also, Fado. This is the style, right? So it's called Fado. Fado. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Terrific. And so now um, you're in Chicago. You work uh, for IES, International Education Service. Um, tell us how you got that job and how Fulbright kind of informed your, your transition to working in the field of study abroad and international education. Yeah, so, so I'll back up before Fulbright because essentially my current position at IS was inspired by the time that I was um, an intern with IS in Dublin. Okay. Uh, so when I did the IS summer internship program, and yes, I was a marketing major and I was doing the really cool internship as a radio host for a news station. Um, I had no idea what I could do specifically with a marketing major. And I realized with the center staff at IS Dublin that um, what they did was a real job. So supporting students on their international experiences um, is an entire field in itself. So international education um, is a field and an industry. And that's where I discovered that. So um, throughout the university, I held many different positions that um, kind of built a lot on a lot of experiences to be able to kind of point towards a trajectory towards international education. And Fulbright actually affirmed that I needed to be student facing and still in a realm of education, preferably international education, because I see it as so incredibly valuable to students' lives. Um, so it was actually that my current position was recommended to me by um, someone from the University of Iowa Study Abroad office. <laughs> so they, because they knew I was looking for a job after Portugal. Um, Portugal Fulbright, unfortunately doesn't have an extension year like other countries do, mm -hmm. so I had to return. Um, but I interviewed with IS Abroad um, in their internships division, and then now I'm here. So very full circle moment. Um, things that I did take away from Fulbright that have definitely helped me in my current role are continuing to advocate for ideas and advocate for students. Those are probably the two biggest um, pieces that I've taken away from all of those experiences in my current job. Great. And then and two follow-up questions, um, you know, kind of dealing with your, your professional background. Mm -hmm. How did your, uh, your background in marketing, mm -hmm. or your experience in marketing help you in your current job, help you get the job? And how did your experience in radio yeah. help you get that, this job? So with marketing and radio, it's a lot of how to draw people in. I always view marketing as a social science because it's studying that the way people perceive things. Um, I have actually helped out our own marketing team in some ways because I've had the student experience first. And then uh, with my marketing background, I can see some things or make suggestions um, for some improvements, like say on our website or with outreach for students, especially. Um, with radio, I guess because of my voice and my personality, I have tended to be even asked <laughs> to help with a lot of marketing and outreach materials. So you may see me on some promotional videos for our programs um, because of that, you know, radio personality presence. So yeah, both very intertwined, so very relevant to what I do. Excellent, excellent. No, I, I can certainly imagine you on promotional videos, voiceovers, things like that. I think you'd be the, the perfect person for those, uh, uh, for the, the, those activities. And so, you know, now we're living in the time of, of COVID and that means that in the world of IES and study abroad in general, things have kind of slowed down. I mean, obviously there are virtual opportunities that students are, take, are taking advantage of. I know that you're promoting those virtual opportunities in your current position, but if you could tell us a little bit more about how you've pivoted 
during the, the, the pandemic and sort of where you are now and where you see things going once we emerge from the, the COVID era? Mm -hmm. So for one, in terms of pivoting, of course, we're all remote right now. Um, programs have been suspended or canceled because there's lack of student mobility and ability to do so until we don't know when. So for now, um, until students can safely go abroad and we can receive exchange students here, um, like I'm thinking Iowa, for example, with its international students, um, it needs to be virtual for the time being. However, I will say that on the virtual internship side, we see this as being a more sustained program, given that in a lot of ways, virtual internships especially can be more accessible to certain students. So it could be for students that may not have the ability to go abroad, um, there may be some financial concerns, or they would prefer to maybe hold multiple jobs over the course of a semester or summer, or taking classes, whatever it may be, we have seen that that those programs in that regard have tended to be a bit more accessible than our on-site programs. Now, when the time comes to go back, from what we've seen, we do think that there will be a lot of students wanting to go abroad. Um, I can tell you like from our end, there's a lot, a lot of interest already looking towards the summer, which we have fingers crossed at what that's going to look like. But um, when the time comes for sure that everyone can go abroad, I do expect to see a lot of movement. So I think things will may return to normal in that sense, but we may even see more of an increase because maybe people um, are a little bit tired of being in their home. <laughs> so they're like, where can I go next? So that's kind of how I see a couple of changes. And then of course, as we kind of shift through the post pandemic, um, you know, taking health and safety into account. So maybe modifying a few things to be able to ensure that. But I think you're going to see a lot of student study abroad and internship applications after the pandemic. Right. Because there, there's no doubt that there's a lot of pent up demand. And mm -hmm. once we get a vaccine and once we're able to interact, you know, uh, in person more than we are now, obviously, uh, students and others are going to take advantage of, of, of these new opportunities. Um, and so there is, is going to be this um, resurgence of study abroad and global education. I mean, people always want what they can't have. Mm -hmm. And so when they feel constrained, uh, they're naturally going to move in the opposite direction. And so one of the questions that we face, I think, in international education, and especially in study abroad, is are we going to have the capacity to meet that pent-up demand? Yep. Um, and so that's something that we definitely have to have to prepare for. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that'll be the next phase then, too, is demand, you know, assisting that demand. Right. Um, and then, so I'm wondering, you know, I, I guess one other thing that, that I would that I would add, and I would like your your perspective on this too, is that it is true that you know the current electronic era um, d does provide access to certain students or populations that wouldn't ordinarily participate in uh, global experiences, mm -hmm. and so I think we can imagine a future where you know we have kind of a hybrid format. On the one hand, we do have a lot of pent-up demand and people are going to be going abroad. But I think we've learned some valuable lessons uh, in this COVID era about, you know, connecting electronically, doing things virtually, and seeing a certain value in those projects and activities. So my hope is that we can balance both moving forward. I think there are going to be some things about connecting virtually that we're not going to want to give up. You know, there, there are issues of convenience, there are issues of, you know, um, connecting almost instantly and all over the world across different time zones. Uh, it's less expensive. Uh, there are fewer logistics involved in many cases. And so those benefits, I think, are going to carry forward in one way or, or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would completely agree with you 100%, Russ. So yeah, I think moving forward, again, I believe any form of international experience and touch point is highly valuable because it teaches you so much about how to work with a variety of different people. So again, we like to say transferable skills that you will use in your future careers. So very good. All right, Rita, we're, we're going to field some questions from the, the audience 
now. Um, and here is the, the first one. So mm -hmm. if you had to go back to the start of your college career, what would you do differently? And would you go someplace different? Okay, so I'll take the last question. No, I would not go someplace different um, because the University of Iowa allowed me to become, I think, a lot closer to people than I think I may have been able to at other universities I was looking at. Um, so there's that. I wouldn't change anything on where I went to school. In terms of differently though, I personally wish I would have been more involved in the cultural houses a lot earlier on uh, because I think I probably would have been more embedded with a lot of programs and probably met even more friends that way. Um, I didn't really become with more so the uh, Latino, Native American and cultural center until closer to um, my senior year, which is a little bit late looking back. Um, so if I could go back, I would have joined um, and attended a lot more of their events and events at the Afro House. So that's something, you know, and student involvement, I was pretty involved, but, you know, could e always have done a little bit more. Right. And, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, one of the things that our office, international programs that we've tried to do is connect with these affinity houses. Um, you know, we've held certain programs there and things like that. But I'm wondering, do you have any advice on how best to reach these, the, these student groups from the standpoint of promoting international education? Mm -hmm. The best way is to first off talk to the staff and to um, encourage alums of study abroad programs to speak at um, these houses because I've always feel like it's really important to have um, reflected representation. So if you have alums or students that can be ambassadors um, of these programs, to me, that's a really great way to reach out to these affinity houses. And it's never, um, it's never, I think, frowned upon for to just simply ask the staff there too, and the student workers as well, if you can present on um, their programs. But yes, finding students are the best way, I think, to promote any sort of program, because student experiences tends to be the most heard. So... Wonderful, excellent advice. Um, another another question from from the chat. Um, what was the overall attitude toward Americans while you were overseas, mm -hmm. and did you experience any tense moments? Yes. So, in terms of tense, um, to be very honest, it did all have to do with politics. Um, in Portugal, like many cases abroad we got a way more neutral view of what was going on, but a lot of what was going on was very, very concerning. And in almost every class that I taught, all of my students kept bringing up things that I was kind of like, oh, but here we go, you know, here we go again, having to explain um, why that is. So in terms of that, um, there was tension because I, uh, pers my, my personal views do not align with um, the previous administration. And that's what a lot of my students saw coming from the US. Um, they would ask me a lot of things about, let's say gun violence, about racial tensions, especially. Um, and they knew, especially because I was a person of color in the US, they were very curious about what that was like. So when I navigated those conversations, I always prefaced it with, I am one person out of 300 plus million in the United States. I'm going to tell you my lived experiences, but I'm disclosing that this may not be the same opinion or same experience as other people. So to kind of put it as neutrally as I could so students could get different perspectives. And in my classes, I tried to show them um, many different aspects of American culture in that way. Um, but that was, to be honest, that was probably the most tense moments. In terms of views though, so yes, there was that side where there was, from the Portuguese side, a lot of disappointment in the US. But at the same time, what I thought was interesting is that the US was still really reveled as that place to go and to make it. So for a lot of Portuguese people, there was still that idea of the American dream. And I worked with students that were even trying to um, apply to uh, U.S. schools because U.S. universities and colleges were very, very highly regarded, especially in the Portuguese education system. So very interesting dynamics for that. 
Right. Well, we certainly want students from Portugal and Brazil to come to the United States and to the University of Iowa. And I can't think of a better ambassador than than, than you. Um, no, it seems to me that you handled that, that situation very diplomatically, um, you know, because and I've been in similar situations where especially if you're teaching younger students or maybe connecting with their families, you are the United States to them. You are the face of your country. Yep. And so they're going to channel any perception or interpretation through through you. Mm -hmm. And so you're going to have to answer for either certain actions or certain attitudes that you may or may not agree with uh, or even know much about. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's a great responsibility. And that's why in, in Fulbright especially, one of the major criterion that uh, you know, is always asked in the applications is, and, and I've, you know, reviewed a lot of Fulbright applications, is whether or not the applicant will uh, be a, a strong representative or a strong ambassador for the U.S. abroad. Mm -hmm. That is a key component in any application. And so um, there's no doubt that you handled that challenge very, very well. Thank you. <laughs> I did the best I could in that situation. <laughs> Yeah. Um, an additional question from chat. Um, how did you teach people about our state? Um, uh, how did you talk about Iowa yeah. uh, when you were in Portugal? Yeah, so great question because um, a lot of people did not even know what Iowa was. So I started one of our classes by showing a map of the United States and pinpointing exactly what state I'm from and where my home hometown is. Um, when I talked about my state, I had even found uh, YouTube clips and pictures showcasing what life was like. Um, with Iowa tending to be more of a rural place than other states, um, but also very important to, let's say, like our agriculture um, and feeding this country. <laughs> so we play a very key role in, you know, the function of America. And I, I definitely, you know, being an Iowan, I taught my students about that and tried to make sure that they understood that, again, different experiences throughout the U.S. The U.S. is not just California, New York, and Miami, um, but here is a state um, that has a lot of things to offer to the rest of the U.S., and you can find beauty within it. Like, I love the eastern side of the U.S., uh, the eastern side of Iowa, especially where I'm from, to me, gorgeous, so... Well, Decora especially is uh, is a very picturesque place, and so <laughs> I mean it, it's adorable little, little town. You know, you've got the cliffs and the river and mm -hmm. and all of that, and so yeah, you, even just showing pictures of your hometown, I think would would mm -hmm. would appeal to to students in Portugal. Um, and so when you were traveling in in Europe, uh, what did you miss most about the United States? Food. I'm Food. not gonna lie. I really miss. Um, ha, this is going to sound silly, but towards the end, I really want really good fried chicken. I wanted big burgers, um, like ribs, um, oh, pies, just a lot. Yeah, it was mostly food, but even other um, foods like uh, Vietnamese food, banh mi's, um, Thai, you name it. I really, really miss that. <laughs> so food was the thing that I missed the most. Okay, very good. And uh, we'll we'll need to wrap up. And so I'm going to ask you one one more question. And, and now that you're you're back in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and back in Chicago, um, what do you miss the most about about Europe? Uh, um, simplicity in a lot of ways. And I'm not going to lie, especially being in Portugal. To me, it was a lot more affordable place to live. And um, just more of a, just a lot more relaxed. Portugal, Portuguese work and life balance is very, very different to the U.S. And I think we could learn to relax a little bit more because in the U.S. we are very, very, way more work oriented than we are to, um, it's 5 p.m., I'm done, see you later. <laughs> but in Portugal, it's like, I'm done, that's it. Don't contact me, do not bring up anything about work if we go out to dinner afterwards. So I honestly miss that kind of, that, you know, kind of relaxation, take a moment to enjoy your life. Um, yeah, that's the biggest thing I miss. Right. Could you, could you foresee maybe going back to Portugal for an extended stay at some point? I don't know about 
extended stay, but I really miss my friends and a lot of my colleagues. So I would definitely go back to visit. So. All right. That's, that's terrific. Okay. Well, listen, Rita, we can't thank you enough. This was an absolutely wonderful conversation and you are a star. We're so proud of your accomplishments. Thank you for representing the University of Iowa so admirably uh, and continued success in your, in your career. Please know that we're, we're here to support you in all of your endeavors. Yeah. Thank you so much, Russ. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it, it was a delight. Thank you. And thanks to everyone for, for tuning in and listening this afternoon. Thank you.